Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Today we're going to be talking about something very magnificent, uh, as it were, a very big idea in the scriptures from Old Testament to New Testament, and that is this, the kingdom of God. You see it talked about in the Old Testament. You see it built uh, among Israel as they build palaces and kingdoms and temples. And their, uh, their glory kind of expands across Israel in the Old Testament. Um, and you see it talked about in the New Testament by Jesus. You see various figures throughout history expanding their kingdom. Whether it's uh, the Romans or the Mongols or the British Empire or the many other empires that have risen and fallen, even in our own country, uh, the United States, which expanded its territory and its kingdom uh, stretched from one shore to another. Uh, there are kingdoms all over the world. And uh, that is very representative of the way that the scriptures talk to. The scriptures talk about a kingdom, a kingdom that's to come, a kingdom uh, that Jesus brought into this world. And this uh, passage that we're going to meditate on today is one of Jesus' uh, quietest but most prominent teachings about what the kingdom of God is like. It comes from Luke chapter 13, verses uh, 18 through 21. Jesus uses two very profound metaphors to talk about the kingdom of God and what it's like. He'd been teaching throughout his, uh, throughout his ministry about this coming kingdom, and people had begun to ask, well, what is this kingdom? When is it going to come? Where is it at? And so Jesus began to, to teach on it and to share about what the kingdom of God was like. And he uses two beautiful and profound metaphors uh, to, to do it. But they are very, very surprising. So he begins uh, teaching his disciples about this coming kingdom. And he says this. He says, what is the kingdom of God like? And what shall I compare it to? If you just pause there for a moment and you imagine you're sitting at Jesus' feet and you have this kind of Messiah, King, Prophet, Ruler who you have been waiting for and longing for and the scriptures have been proclaiming and talking about he's going to come and he's going to bring this glorious rule and reign across the entire world that will stretch everywhere around the world called the Kingdom of God. And you're sitting at Jesus' feet and he begins this teaching. That says, what's the kingdom of God like? How, how should I compare it to something? What should I compare it to? What sort of metaphor or idea should I use? Dot, dot, dot. I wonder how you, or his disciples even, would have filled that in. A metaphor, an analogy. What would be fitting for them? Maybe they would say, oh, it is like a great army that spreads across the world. Or maybe it's like a sunrise, very magnificent and powerful and majestic. And as it rises, it spreads over everything and crosses the entire land until everybody sees and is affected by this kind of beauty and rain of, uh, of the sun. He, he could have used that sort of metaphor, right? He could have said, it's like a mountain that can't be moved. Strong and mighty is the kingdom of God. Never shall anyone affect it or move it. It stands in power and magnificence and glory. That's what the kingdom of God is like. He could have said that, right? Along with many other metaphors that he could have used to describe this coming kingdom. But he doesn't. What shall I compare it to, he says? It's like a mustard seed. You, I, I would just have imagined that his disciples must have been scratching their head for a moment. A mustard seed? Are you kidding me? Have you seen a mustard seed? You can hardly see it in this picture, but it's in the palm of somebody's hand, this little rinky-dink seed. It's like a mustard seed. Jesus, we were really hoping for something better than that. Okay, better, more powerful, stronger, more glorious. But you're telling us it's like a mustard seed? You've got to be kidding me. If that's what we're following, if that's the kingdom that we're hoping in, 
then we, uh, we're worried. We're concerned. We might need to follow somebody else, somebody who's got some swords and some horses and some power and some glory and some better metaphors than a mustard seed. But Jesus goes on to teach them. He says, what shall I compare it to? It's like a mustard seed, which a man took and he planted into the ground and it grew to become a tree and the birds perched in its branches. See, Jesus kind of catches them off guard. When you think about the seed, you think, oh my goodness, we're in for it. If this is power and glory, we, we better pull up shit stakes and go, go someplace else to find a, a leader. But Jesus says, pay attention to what the mustard seed does. This little, insignificant, small seed, when it's planted into the ground, it triples, doubles, quadruples, hundredfold, gets bigger than what it began as. So this is what a, a mustard tree actually looks like. Starts from that little tiny seed. Or like the sequoia seed that I, I showed you. They don't have sequoias in, uh, in Israel, but if they did, perhaps Jesus would have used that metaphor to say the kingdom of God is like a sequoia seed that you plant in the ground, and then years go by and everybody thinks it's nothing, but then all of a sudden, it catches you off guard and is the most glorious tree you've ever seen. The most powerful tree you've, you've ever seen that you can see from everywhere. Right? That's his metaphor for the kingdom of God and what it's like. He then, uh, though, uses a second metaphor to describe what the kingdom of God is like. And maybe his disciples thought to themselves... Well, uh, maybe he's got something better for the second one, okay? Uh, we, he went from a mustard seed, but maybe that was just kind of warming us up for something bigger. But no thanks. Jesus says, um, the kingdom of God, what shall I compare it to? It's like yeast. That's when it's mixed into uh, the dough, it rises, and when it's worked all through with the flour, it creates this wonderful bread, right? Perhaps they gasped again and said, Jesus, Lord, you really need to work on your metaphors. But Jesus is teaching us something about the kingdom and what it's like. It is not at all like the earthly kingdoms that we experience around the world. It does not come in big power and glory and might and armies and immovable mountains of things. No. But it comes quietly, humbly, unassumingly, how you would never expect it to come. It comes. And it works its way through like yeast in dough. If you put a little bit in, Leave it for a while. Mix it in. All of a sudden you see that yeast affecting everything around it. It's like a seed planted in the garden that you may think it, that nothing is happening. That that's, you'll never see it again. But then all of a sudden it sprouts. And then all of a sudden it blooms into a tree. And then all of a sudden it leaves more seeds. And then you go from having a single tree to having an entire garden of mustard seed trees all around you. There's a lot, I think, that we can learn, not only about the kingdom of God, but our participation in it from this parable. Okay? I want to give you three things today that I really think you can take from this parable that are powerful teachings uh, from this. Okay? Sorry, that's yeast, if you've never seen it. This is, I think, what we can take. First is that the kingdom of God, though seemingly small and insignificant, has and will have a cosmic impact. What I mean by that, I like that word cosmic, kind of all around the world. It, it will change people. Okay? And if you don't believe that, then you should study the movement and history of the church. Because just think for a moment. You've got Jesus born in the middle of nowhere to a poor and destitute family, insignificant at best, who lives in an insignificant place, who grows up with insignificant parents, small and weak. 
He grows up in a place that is constantly being taken over by other powers. The Assyrians, the Babylonians, the Egyptians, everybody. It's just their stomping pad. Okay? They just walk right through Israel throughout history. But this one man, born in humble circumstances, in a manger no less, is planted on the earth, the Son of God, in the most humble way possible. He calls 12 men who are by far not the sharpest tools in the shed, okay? They're tax collectors. Uh, they, they are fishermen. Uh, they are Joe Schmoes, okay? No mighty army, no mighty cabinet of delegate, delegates. They are constantly making mistakes, constantly messing up, constantly not smart enough or good enough or wise enough or trustworthy enough. But the Lord, through His death, His resurrection, and His power in those individuals, you go 2,000 years later, who doesn't know the name of Jesus? Where is the church not found? Where do you not see God's rule and reign? There are places, but you can go to every single continent on the entire world and ask people and say, do you know Jesus? Have you heard of Him? And they'd say, well, yes, I have. Like a mustard seed planted in the ground, the kingdom of God has humble and small and insignificant beginnings. But God's word is true, that it has cosmic impact, even, even though it goes against all reason that our minds would think of. Let me show you a few pictures. Here, you can just look at them for a few, a few minutes, okay, or a few seconds. I think these are, these are wonderful. These are all pictures of churches. This one uh, in Papua New Guinea, in, uh, in the outreaches, the far reaches of Papua New Guinea, uh, a small tribe of people there that have heard the word of God and that the seed was planted and all of a sudden a church springs up, okay? And they worship God and follow him. Here in the mountains of Tibet, somebody walked up a whole lot of hills and mountains and valleys to meet some people and plant a seed. And then all of a sudden, years later, you have a great church planted in the mountains and hills of Tibet. This, a church in Antarctica. Okay? Just a little church for the small few believers there. The thing I'm trying to point out to you is this fact. That the kingdom of God, though seemingly small and insignificant, has great and cosmic impact all around the world. So here's, and, he, and here's where the payday is for me, okay? The church, we all know it, is, uh, is dwindling in the Western world, dwindling in the United States. Every year, more and more churches are shut down, more and more churches are closed. People would think, oh, that mustard seed? That little insignificant word of God, it is, in fact, insignificant. Don't you believe it for a second. The church is spanning the entire globe, and even though it is going through a dark period in the United States, is the word of God still powerful? Is it still worth planting? Is it still worth harvesting? Is it still worth cultivating in the hearts of the people around you and churches and faithful families? Absolutely. And God will tell us over and over and over again, you may think it's small, you may think it's insignificant, but guess what? It has greater power than anything in all the world. So that's our first lesson that I think we can take from this. The second is this, that we ought not feel that our part in, the, in kingdom business, okay, however simple or unseen, will ever be insignificant, okay? You can be a part of a small little church. You can be a part of a small little family or a small little community. You can be serving in very, very simple ways. But the Word of God and this mustard seed lesson tells us that everything from teaching your children about the Lord to singing hymns on Sunday to being a part of the church to seeing your neighbor in need and helping them, all of those things, no matter how insignificant, are those powerful seeds of the Word of God. I, 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 I see a lot of people 
who think their lives and their vocations and their callings, whether it's as a plumber or a teacher or, uh, or, or, or working phone sales or whatever, or working at the cashier checkout line, that their job is somehow insignificant. God would say no. Listen, I used ordinary men in ordinary places and ordinary women in, women in ordinary spaces to work my word and the power of my word into the culture around. The church spread through single individuals living out the word of God in the community of the church. So never ever see your job, whether it be as a postman or in a supermarket or a pastor or a teacher or whatever, as insignificant. It has deep abiding power to affect change in the world. The final thing, and I think the final lesson that we learn from this parable is this. That it is only as we are mixed in and worked through that we can have an impact for God's kingdom. And if you're focusing on God's word in this, you'll notice that each time, whether it be through the mustard seed or the yeast, that it's not left by itself. Okay? The mustard seed, it's taken and it's planted in the ground. Okay? The yeast is taken, put into a bowl of flour and mixed around. Neither of those two things work unless they are mixed into the world around them. And it's the same for us as Christians. You can keep your faith isolated to yourself. Okay? You can keep your faith and your family and your church isolated to itself. But if you do, do not expect the seed of the word of God to live and grow. As Christians, we are called, as the Apostle Paul tells us, to be in the world, but not of it. It sounds like that language, right? A distinctly different thing, like a mustard seed in the ground, like yeast in the flour. We are called to be in the world around us as Christians, okay? And that is how the world is affected and changed around us. So do you mingle? Do you rub shoulders? Do you get to know? Do you have conversations as a Christian with those who are not Christians? Or do you have your kind of little holy community that just keeps to itself? If you do, remember the power and the tale of the mustard seed and the yeast that calls us to be mixed in and worked through. I, I like that phrase. I almost feel like I could just, you know, it's like a bumper sticker or something. Mixed in. Works through. That's where the power of the kingdom of God comes. And that's what we're called to be. Distinctly different from the world. But mixed in. And worked through. So as you live your lives this week, remember the power of the word of God in the insignificant things of life. Okay? And remember that we are called to be mixed in. Worked through in our world as salt and light, as seed and yeast in the world to affect change so that God's glory may be pronounced across the entire world. Let's join together in prayer. Lord God, Heavenly Father, we pray, Lord, that the seed of your word would dwell in us, that it would change us, that it would affect us, that the death and resurrection of your son, that seed laid in the ground and then raised up, would work in our lives, mixed into the world, shared in our neighborhoods and communities and families. May we never see your call of insignificant and small work as, as actually insignificant or powerless, but instead may we put faith and hope in your living word, which brings glory and expands throughout the entire world. It's in your son's holy and powerful name that we pray. Amen.